Mornings. I'm super excited to be here. This is my first Creative Mornings, but you know, if there's crafts and coffee and tacos, I will definitely be back. Um, I really think maybe I'm here today because Evan from the Neon Jungle already spoke this summer about craft. And so they were like, oh, well, Jennifer does that. But you know what? We've got this thing on tradition. Let's call that girl that has over 100 Christmas trees and, you know, a tattoo of a Christmas tree. Like, she'd be perfect for the December gig. And, you know, here I am. <laughs> so thanks for having me. All right. So Ben kind of gave you a rundown about, you know, my life and what it is I do and I have done and I'm going to do and all that kind of stuff. But here is kind of a little bulleted list. I was talking to some people earlier when we were doing crafts saying that I know there's a lot of graphic designers here. I am not a graphic designer. So don't judge me on my little spreadsheet. I see you. It was you. You and I were talking. Um, you know, I call myself a creative content designer, but really what I do primarily is I glue stuff to stuff. So, but you know, on an elevator pitch or on LinkedIn, creative content designer sounded better. But really, instead of a slideshow, it was like, taking everything in my power not to make like poster board with glitter and like <laughs> lights and letters, but you know, I decided to go all pro for y'all. All right, God bless Canva. Okay, so <laughs> our talk is all about tradition. So when Ben asked me to do this talk, I kind of went down that rabbit hole like we all do when we're researching a topic, and I was like, you know, reading, like, what is the actual dictionary.com definition of tradition? And, you know, what is some witty quotes to talk about early in the morning over breakfast tacos, all of that kind of thing. And what kept hitting me was the idea that the word traditional, I kept coming back to the word traditional and kind of realizing that for me, I'm really not all that traditional. I mean, you would think, you know, the 100 Christmas trees part, you know, and I'm a card carrying member of the PTA, that it would be like a big thing for me. But actually, I'm really kind of into the tradition of not being all that traditional, as it turns out. Who knew? Who knew this was going to be a journey of self discovery for me? But apparently it is. All right, so nothing brings up tradition like the holidays, right? We all have our own. At my house, we always have chicken spaghetti, which I swear is better than it sounds on Christmas Eve. We open stockings first. Santa never wraps his gifts. I'm that annoying mother that gets everybody matching pajamas and we have to take way too many pictures, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I'm sure you guys all have your own version of what a holiday tradition looks like. You know, but then I got to thinking about with the holidays and beyond, more and more traditions, you know, traditional traditions are being like remixed and kind of reinvented and reinterpreted. Traditions are important, but sometimes they can also kind of imply things like stagnation or, you know, they can become irrelevant or outdated. And so sometimes those traditions need to be kind of like tweaked. Nowadays, families are blended. Freelance careers are a hodgepodge of different disciplines. I know a lot of y'all relate to that. And places like Austin are really this kind of kaleidoscope of different cultures. So all that being said, we kind of have to reconcile with all these different traditions and ideas and kind of make our own. I know you. <laughs> I'm like, you bought my old house. OK, so anyway. <laughs> all right, slide five. I know you get up here and you're like, I know you from the internet. <laughs> Okay, so wait, let's see, slide five. You know, I had to have the obligatory quote because of course you do. If you're gonna do a speech in the morning, you gotta have that quote, make you sound really smart. So Henry James, the author said, a tradition is kept alive only by adding something to it. So that's kind of what this whole talk is gonna be about, taking traditional things and kind of adding your own spin to it. A lot of times traditional is synonymous with conventional or common or popular. And like I said, I really started to realize that a lot of my traditions and beliefs were not necessarily all that traditional, nor were those of my friends or my family or my creative contemporaries. A lot of the people I follow, you know, the guys, I'm blanking on the guy's name today, but I just took my kids to um, Meow Wolf this summer, and there's Scott Hove is his name, and he does, I don't know if you've seen it, but he does very traditional looking cakes with very elaborate piping on them, but then they have like teeth and fangs, do you know what I mean? So it's just like super traditional thing, but he was like, surprise, just kidding. So 
I realize that the tradition of not being traditional has really been my secret sauce for making a living as a creative content designer, AKA crafter, for the last 20 years. All right, so we're gonna take a little stroll down memory lane and we're gonna talk about genetics for a hot second. So this is, this is my dad and also my mom and my sister. So a family tradition is, you know, something that's passed down, right? So obviously you guys know how this thing works where you got a mom and you got a dad and then they make that baby that's got like a little bit of both. So from my dad's side, he was, He's, I mean, he still is. He was a psychologist his whole career. He was a psychology professor, but he always fancied himself a bit of a side hustler. So he always had that, like, I know. He, like, was like, I'm a day trader, and I've got real estate, and I've got an oil and gas company. And so he was always, like, pushing that on my younger sister and I, like, I mean, from like the time I was a child, it's like anything I made, like if I glued a macaroni noodle, it was like, you should totally sell that, like on a street corner. And that's kind of what we did. We would be, my sister and I literally, she would be out there with like puffy paint, like making these like hideous t-shirts and selling them on the corner. And I was right there like making earrings out of fishing lures, like the long, like really slimy kind. I'm pretty sure it was because that was the only thing that came in neon colors at our local Walmart, because I grew up in a really small town in Texas. So that being said, sometimes, you know, your idea of career is super deeply rooted in this tradition. So my dad was always pushing that side hustle thing on me. But, you know, for him, he grew up in a small town in Illinois where what you did is you went to high school, then you went and you worked at Caterpillar Tractors. Like, that is what you did. And so for his dad, it was just like, what do you mean you're going to be this thing called a psychologist? Like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Somebody's going to pay you to talk to people? And he was like, yeah, just you watch. So, you know, meanwhile, like, my grandma and my grandpa, like, all through graduate school were just like, I can't believe you're doing this. Like, you could be making tractors. And then they came... <laughs> And they, and they visited, and they took a ride in this Cadillac, and they were like, okay, like, we totally get it now. So, like, my dad broke that tradition by going to college and becoming a shrink. And then when I graduated from high school, you know, he kind of did the same thing to me. Like, you want to go and be a psychologist, right? Like, that's what you want to do. Like, you want to, like, take over the family business. So I went and I got my psych degree. I like to tell people I'm a very well-adjusted crafter. But then I kind of, you know, from there, like, I didn't really want to go on to graduate school, and I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to be creative, and I wanted to do something creative, but just like my grandpa was like, you should be making a tractor. My dad was, like, always sending me, like, job listings, like, little clips from the paper, like, look at this job I found that you could do with a degree in psychology. Like, literally, like, little pieces of paper from the Dallas Morning News were always coming in my mailbox. And then one day, my jewelry business got profiled in the Wall Street Journal, like a full page thing about my business and my dad like saw it, he read it, he framed it and the job listings quit coming. So like that was, that was basically like, you know, he got, he took his dad for a ride in the Cadillac and I was like, look, I got the Wall Street Journal so quit nagging me on it. So that's where I got from my dad. Like his version of a traditional career was different than mine, which was different than his dad. My kids will probably wear a suit and tie and work in corporate. I feel it coming already. <laughs> Every time I go to the thrift store with my daughter, she's like, I am only shopping at Target when I'm older. So <laughs> she's, she's already trying to spite me. All right, so we have the uh, genetics for my dad, right? So my other hot and heavy passion is obviously crafting, gluing stuff to stuff. Boom, boom. So, um, you know, both of my maternal and my paternal grandparents were creative. And my mom, you can see her there, she was the crafty wind beneath my wings. It's funny, I talk about her, and the sun shines down on me. So... <laughs> She's here with me, watching me. So she was a psychologist as well, but I really think that was mostly just to try to impress my dad. Like, you know, she was like, sure, I'll go to graduate school. And then she was like just crafting all the time. What she really taught me was to take all those traditional crafting things and kind of put your own spin on it and to not be afraid of any different kind of creative medium. So my sister and I, like she literally, there was like nothing she didn't do. She could solder, she could sculpt, she could sew, and she never met a power tool she didn't like. So, you know, that saying about like honing, honing your skill and honing your craft, I'm kind of like the exact opposite. I'm like a Jill of all trades, a master of some. I was thinking about it when I was writing this, and in the last month, I've taken a macrame class at craft. Have any of you guys been to craft yet? It's pretty awesome. 
boom. Okay. And then I went and painted like those ceramic peg trees at a paint your own pottery place. And then I went to like a wreath making party. So I'm kind of all over the place. And I really get that from my mom. She was a creative force to be reckoned with and kind of her own renegade crafter. So now here we are, right? I got the genetics. I got the hustle. I got the creative part. And then, you know, you have me. Um, all right. Next slide. Okay. Naughty Secretary Club. No, I am not still the Naughty Secretary Club. But once upon a time, people would come up to me and be like, you're the Naughty Secretary. Now, you know, and I'd have to remind people, but they would do the URL, like, don't forget the club. For the love of God, don't forget the club. <laughs> yeah. Or they would be like, wow, I didn't know you were so limber. And I was like, yeah. Um, all right. So I started my, like, official creative career as a jewelry designer. I took, you know, your traditional jewelry class, like, let me learn how to string a bead at Nomadic Notions over on Anderson, if anybody remembers that place. Yes, like, you know, they tried to teach me the way, but I pretty quickly deviated onto, like, baby rattles and cupcake toppers. I was like, yes, that's the kind of jewelry I want to make. Um, I wanted to learn how to make jewelry because at the time there wasn't like jewelry that I really wanted to wear. You know, there wasn't anything that was like tacky enough for my taste. So like my Dremel and I, we just kind of went rogue and went like crazy. So at the time, let me kind of give you a rundown on how Naughty Secretary Club got started. I was fresh out of college and I was an administrative assistant, AKA the Naughty Secretary Club. At that time I was writing my own zine, mostly about music. I was freelancing for other music zines, kind of interviewing bands. Really, I was warming bar stools at Emo's most of the time saying I was interviewing bands, but you know. Anyway, and I even co-owned a record label. At that time, jewelry was really just kind of this hobby for me, and I just sporadically sold it on my website. This was before Etsy. This is when you had to like invent your own shopping cart and learn, you know, how to make your own little web page. It's like me with Canva. The website looked about that good. Yeah, Mal's Ecom, exactly. That's exactly what it was. So then, kind of like the Wall Street Journal story, you know, I'm here, I'm this administrative assistant, I'm making jewelry on the side. I got a full page feature in Bust Magazine. Does anybody here know Bust? It's still around? Okay, yeah. So I, I just saw Debbie last year, the editor, and I was like, you know, I really kind of owe my whole career to you. So I got this full page review or write up on this jewelry I was making. I was making this chunky resin jewelry. I don't think any of it's pictured here with uh, images of celebrities in it. Hot tip. Don't do that. It's a copyright thing. Anyway, and so I had to learn that one the hard way. But anyway, so I got that full page peach feature and I got so many orders within like a 24 hour period that I had to kind of make this life choice like, am I gonna stay an administrative assistant and write all these people and say, I just don't physically have the time to make your orders? Or am I gonna take that leap of faith and go down this path of this like creative career and then tell the day job like, sorry, I can't answer your phones anymore. So clearly, you, you, we all know the answer I made, and I you know, haven't worn pantyhose since, and it's been glorious. And so, and that is kind of how the Naughty Secretary Club came to be, and what that really taught me, I know it's not a very traditional way of starting a career, but what it taught me was really the power of like marketing and PR and spin and how important it is even for a creative business. So, you know, I got, I know about the side hustle, I know how to make stuff, but that like marketing PR component is super important. So eventually Naughty Secretary Club was featured in places like the New York Times, L, 17, all kinds of places. I even wrote a book called the Naughty Secretary Club. So you can, you know, you can drill your own baby rattles if you want, I'll show you how. All right, so next. So, you know, I've got, I got my business, right? And so back then there wasn't a creative morning. So what's a girl like me to do? I want to network with my friends. We want to swap business tips. And the only like real kind of networking events that existed were very formal and very traditional. There's that word again. And I didn't really fit into that and neither did my friends. So instead we decided to start our own networking group called the Austin Craft Mafia. Um, several of us were working in traditional mediums and crafts and all those kinds of things, but like, you know, Henry James was saying earlier, we kind of put our own spin on it. A good example is one of my Austin Craft Mafia founders is Jenny Hart from Sublime Stitching, and she's a really good example if you're familiar with her work. She does embroidery, but it's like... It's not your typical kind of embroidery if you look it up. Yeah, so, and then my sister, Hope Perkins, then she was going under the name Hot Pink Pistol. Remember we talked about her earlier with the puffy paint? 
she still uses puffy paint, but you know, she, she studied painting and she studied, you know, the fine tradition of fine art painting. She even studied in France. But instead, you know, she got well known for going to the thrift store, getting old clothes, old canvases and painting dead rap stars on it. That was like her thing back then. Not so traditional again. All right. So from there, we kind of it just kind of blew up. It kind of became this PR machine. And we had the term craft mafia trademarked and then other branches kind of popped up around the country, some of them still exist. You can see here I have New Orleans and Oceanside. Um, and then from there also, like we got contacted by the DIY network and we had our own TV show called Stylicious. Not my name choice. And then from there, um, I got tapped to do my own daily TV show for DIY and HGTV called Craft Lab. So like every morning you could tune in and you could craft with me and a guest and it was super fun. All right. so. Next slide. So now I got my business. I got my girl gang. So where in town are we going to sell our stuff? We wanted to have a venue, like a place to sell our things. And some of us were making clothing. Like my sister, you know, that's her, one of her dresses there with, you know, I don't know, some dead rap star on it, bless his heart. And so um, there was already places like Blue Genie here in town or Armadillo, but that was super local, hyper focused here in town. And so we wanted to include our, you know, our friends from out of state and around the world and whatnot. So we wanted something a little bit different. And this, we, you know, this before something like Renegade Craft Fair was coming here, they were in their infancy, infancy and they weren't traveling yet. So along with three of my Austin Craft Mafia buddies, we started the Stitch Fashion Show in Gorilla Craft Bazaar. That's one of, that's our cute little logo there. Um, we had vendors from all over the country. You could buy handmade jewelry. You could get your hair done by birds. They had a booth. Carlo Rossi was there with free drinks. All kinds of fun stuff. We had really big craft companies, little crafters that don't even do it anymore. Um, a few people you might know if you listen to KLBJ on your way here, the, uh, Dudley and Bob with Matt show. Matt Bearden was our MC before he was uh, spinning the hits for President Obama. DJ Mel was our DJ, all kinds of people like that. Um, and then we also had, you know, like I said, big companies coming and small companies coming to sponsor us, like a little baby startup at the time called Etsy. You know, back, back when like they were little and we. All right, so Stitch started at Ruta Maya. And then we sold out, and then we went to Emos, old Emos, like Red River Emos, for two years, and we sold out. And then we went to the Austin Music Hall, and we sold out. And then we went to the Austin Convention Center, and I got pregnant, and we all quit. <laughs> and that's how the story goes. Don't worry, it was totally planned. I was married. It was all good. But um, really, the truth is, we were just scaling a lot faster. And if you've ever run, you know, some of you, your own small business, you think like, yes, we want to be big and we want to be huge, but sometimes scaling super fast is kind of scary and intimidating. And we were just, you know, young and didn't know how to handle it. And if you've ever done like event things, like it's kind of a thankless job. Like you think like, man, y'all are just raking in the money from sponsors, but it's really not like that. So that was Stitch. It is no longer in existence. Not even all of us still craft. All right. So, speaking of popping out puppies, um, with your own kids, this is where you really get to go crazy and create your own traditions. If you have a family tradition that's been passed down to you that you really hate, you can kick that guy to the curb. You can pass down stuff like a love of crafts or side hustle. And you can start your own tradition of, you know, having family portraits done. I was like, my poor kids are never going to go sit at an Olin Mills in a tie in a stiff dress like... So instead, we have family portraits done every year. And that's just like one of my traditions. And that's what's kind of cool is you can start your own new ones with your own family. As a mom, I have a lot of jobs, obviously. But creating fun traditions for my family, like a gallery wall of weird portraits, is one of them. Um, you know, and then we're going to bring it back to Christmas. We're going to bring it back to the holidays here. Um, my kids are really the reason that I started going nuts for the holidays and Christmas. Otherwise, like at this point, they would be like, you totally phone this in. At Halloween, I had like 10 Halloween trees up and it really was like crazy Halloween. If any of you guys follow me on social and you saw it, my daughter was like, you phoned it in this year. It's like, Psh, whatever kid. All right, so Kitchmas. 
Like I said, I'm bringing it back to the holidays, bringing it back. So what is kitschmas? I didn't invent the term, but I have used it for myself. I like to refer to kitschmas as Christmas with a wink, a smile, and a whole lot of trips to the thrift store. Um, it's that kind of a slightly tacky version of Christmas, the very non-traditional version of Christmas. At, at Kitchmas, my house looks like, I'm sorry, I'm a thumb licker, I can't stop it. Kitchmas at my house looks like Santa threw up everywhere, and really, like, that's just how, that's how my kids like it at this point. That's what they want. Um, and so I want to say this before you judge me and you think that I am passing down the, uh, the idea of gross amounts of consumerism to my children as a tradition. I want to say that A... I am a brand ambassador for a Christmas tree company called Treetopia. B, I get paid to decorate for the holiday, so I kind of got to do it right. And C, remember that part about the thrift store? Most of my stuff is vintage. So I just want to go ahead and preface that. Um, so Christmas, Kitchmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever, they're all full of traditions. Maybe yours is like an ugly Christmas sweater or a white elephant gift. We all have our own holiday traditions. Next slide. All right, so now, when I'm not decorating for Kitchmas, what am I doing besides thinking about well, how I'm going to decorate for Kitchmas next year? Well, <laughs> because it's a, it's a year-long sport. Um, like I said, I am primarily a creative content designer for various companies. Um, crafts are something that are super steeped in tradition, just like Christmas. But like I was saying earlier, the thing of it is, is myself and my friends and my contemporaries, we tend to put our own different spin on it. You can keep a traditional craft alive, but you can also make it, I'm like, there's people like pumping iron, it's very distracting. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I should be doing squats with them. All right. So you can keep a traditional craft alive and well at the same time and make it snarky. Like if you look up somebody like subversive cross stitch, like it's like PG-13 cross stitch. So she's like got an old school tradition, but it's got bad words in it. And so, or like Fort Lonesome, Kathy Seaver, she's here in town. She does, yeah, she does chain stitch embroidery, but it's not, you know, it's not the typical chain stitch stuff that you would think about. So currently, I wear a lot of different hats, but as Ben said, I do host a weekly show for the DIY Network. You can watch me every Thursday. Yesterday, I made Christmas ornaments and ice cream cones. Next Thursday, you can take a tour of my Kitchmas house because that's what I'm going to be doing. Um, I also write for HGTV, Travel Channel, Howl's, all like, like take Howl's for example. It's all non-traditional houses. And whatever else the freelance gods throw at me. I know a lot of you are the freelance, so you totally get that part. Um, in the last year, I've thrown parties for Big Lots. I spoke on different panels, hosted meetups for South by Southwest. And if any of you went into the official ACL store this festival season, you might have seen the tree I pom-pom bombed. It's a thing. Um, so I'm adamant about keeping the tradition of handcrafted goods alive. I'm just also adamant about doing it in a non-traditional way and in bright colors and probably with a pom-pom on it. So, all right, I'm wrapping it up. So the thing I'm handing down to my kids and to you is like, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to tradi traditions. I'm not gonna quit eating chicken spaghetti, which again, I swear is better than it sounds. Um, I just think that everybody should feel okay about tweaking traditions and making it work better for you. People need to be careful about clinging so tightly to any traditional method of creativity or networking or career choices or even parenting that they're not always exploring and innovating and learning and creating and kind of forging their own path. Um, sometimes you need to break a little bit with tradition or maybe just like bend it just a little bit. Um, the tradition of not being all that traditional is what has worked for me in my career in the creative industry for over 20 years now, and it's what put me in front of you guys today. The end.